Hi everyone, my name's Mad, and if you're wanting to build a compact storage server, there really aren't a ton of options for enclosures. John's Bow's come out with a few interesting offerings in the past couple of years, and there are older ones like the Frap Design Node 304, but none of them have piqued my interest quite like this one I'm checking out in today's video. This is the mod case mass, which unlike a normal case that you would buy and have shipped to you, this one you actually download and print out on a 3D printer. In today's video, we're going to be building and setting up a pretty unique storage server featuring an affordable AliExpress NAS board, plenty of hard drives, and with it all being housed in this modular 3D printed case. This server build is running Unraid and will work great for file storage, along with being able to run a number of other tasks like hosting a media server, a VPN, and a bunch of other stuff like home automation. This build is mostly centered around the case, so let's start by talking about that. The mod case mask does have a free version that's pretty feature rich and honestly would have worked for this build, but I decided to pony up the $27 to get the paid version that offers support for more drives, PCIe expansion, and a couple of other accessories and add-ons. There are a ton of files to print, but the included instruction PDF has everything you'll need from recommended materials and printer settings, extra hardware required, and even troubleshooting tips. Now to print all the files required for the max configuration, it took around 55 hours of print time and a little over 1.5 kilograms of filament. Now keep in mind that these numbers are with zero failed prints and on a fast printer. Specifically, I'm using this X1 Carbon that Bamboo Labs provided for me to make some videos with. I'll be talking about this printer more later in the video, but the TLDR is this printer very much lives up to the hype. I printed in a number of different materials including PLA, PETG, and ABS, and believe it or not, even with well over a hundred hours of print time, I have had zero failed prints, and have had to spend exactly zero time on calibrating or bed leveling. Periodic maintenance is required, but this printer just works, which is an incredible thing to experience after using less advanced printers. So I printed out all these parts in white ABS, but the cool thing about this being 3D printed and modular is that you can customize it with various colors of filament. Now there are a ton of pieces as you can see on screen, so let's just focus on these four first which make up the main chamber. All of these pieces are held together with number 4 by 3 quarter inch screws, but you can also use ones like these M3 by 20 millimeters that you can get enough of for only a couple of bucks on AliExpress. With the main chamber together, I popped in these clips into the four slots on each side. These are used in a number of places on this case and work incredibly well. They allow for a toolless but secure mounting of parts and panels and are very satisfying to use. The drive cage that holds up to five three and a half inch drives is printed in two parts and has to be screwed together with four screws. This can go above or below the main chamber, but I'd recommend below if you're filling it up with a bunch of drives to keep the center of gravity low. What's cool about this case is even though I'm only using one drive cage for this build, in the future I can add another for a total of 10 3.5 inch drives which is an insane amount of storage in a very small footprint. The bottom panel screws on and the feet just slip on. I printed the feet in ABS but a flexible material like TPU is recommended. The top panel screws together with the fan spacer and I inserted a 140mm fan as you can't put in one once the top is installed. And also this is the first time I've ever used the flexible extender in my multi bit kit but it worked well to get into the tight spaces. With that, the main shell was assembled and I could start putting hardware inside. So let's talk about the other parts going into the build. Inside of this box is an ITX board that is perfect for a server build like this one. For $120 on AliExpress, you can get this ITX board that features an integrated Intel N100 CPU and cooler. Now, the N100 isn't anything amazing performance wise, but for a storage server like this, it'll work out great. Also, the M100 has onboard graphics along with pretty good power efficiency. The motherboard it's attached to has a ton of features like dual M.2 slots, 6 SATA ports, and 4 2.5 gig networking ports which is awesome to see. There's also one PCIe slot that could be used to add more SATA ports if you're wanting to go up to 10 3.5 inch drives. Unfortunately this board only supports a single SODIMM RAM stick and it uses pricey DDR5. Speaking of which, I just grabbed a 16GB stick of basic team group SODIMM DDR5 running at 4800MHz. This board officially supports up to 32GB, but 16GB should be plenty for a build like this. In the M.2 slots, I'm throwing in two random 500GB NVMe SSDs that I had on hand. 
one from Western Digital and the other from MSI. Now, I'll be talking about how I'll use these in the software section, but these will not be used for the OS because the operating system is actually going on this USB 3 drive that will plug into the internal USB port here. Unraid is designed to run off of a USB drive, and it's actually better to use a USB 2 drive instead of USB 3, from my understanding, as they get less hot. With everything in the board, I could pop in the IO shield, which fit pretty well, and lower the board into place and attach it with four screws that are the larger type, like what you'd use for a power supply. For hard drives, I actually have four left over from my first storage server build, which are these 8TB Seagate drives that I shucked from external drives. These are SMR drives, which is not at all ideal for a server build, but actually work out okay for Unraid, but definitely shouldn't be used with ZFS and TrueNAS. These install into these basic drive caddies, which again were printed in ABS, but would be more ideal in TPU. Then these could be slid in one at a time into four of the five slots. Then I realized I had the bottom chamber facing the wrong way, so I had to remove four screws, flip it around like this, then put the screws back in. Next, I popped on this cover that prevents the drives from sliding out and tried to use the thumb screws but ended up just needing to use a regular screwdriver and then attached the optional handle. With that done, I threw in another 140mm fan in this slot and covered it with this cover. The final part to go in was the 650 watt SFX power supply from FSP. I don't really recommend this specific unit for a build like this, but I had it on hand and even though it is overkill, it works out fine. With that being said, I do recommend you use a modular unit like this one because space is limited. Then it was just a matter of wiring everything up and popping on all the panels. With the full build done, this was looking pretty nice in my opinion and from afar, I don't think you'd know this case is 3D printed. Also for a power button, you have a few different options. One is just buying a power button like this one or the option I went with which is soldering a few jumper wires to an MX style mechanical switch and using that which works out great and is very cheap if you have an extra switch and wire on hand. Powering the system on for the first time, I was happy to see it booted right into BIOS and I was able to confirm that everything was being detected and meant I was ready to install the OS. I decided to go with Unraid because of the drives I'm using along with the fact expanding the array is very easy to do in the future compared to using something like ZFS and TrueNAS. Just as a disclaimer, this is not a tutorial and I'm not an expert so I'll leave a few guides linked down below but I will go over the general process. Now Unraid is a paid OS but you can try it out for 30 days for free to see if you like it or not which I think is awesome. Their USB installer wasn't working so I had to manually move the files and make the drive bootable. Then I could take it over to the new server, plug it into the internal USB port and boot it up. It booted right into Unraid and a minute later gave me an IP address to access the server from. So I went to my main PC, typed in the IP address and was then prompted to create a root password. Then I signed in to start the 30 day trial and was sent right into Unraid. I first enabled dark mode and then selected an image to represent my server. Then it was time to create an array. You can have up to two parity drives which I would normally recommend, but because this build is just for testing I only selected to have one parity drive, meaning I'll have the capacity of three 8TB drives and will be able to lose any one drive without losing any data. Then I hit start and it started to create the array and make the parity drive which the larger the parity drive the longer it'll take. This 8TB drive took around 15 hours but luckily this is just a one time thing when setting it up. I also had to format one of the drives that was listed as unmountable. Then I could stop the array and add a new cache pool that uses both of the 500GB SSDs and from my understanding these will be mirrored by default meaning there will be some protection in the case of a drive failure. Now I won't be using these as a write cache for the array, instead I think it would be best used to hold VMs and app data that would benefit from a faster SSD. For example in a media server like Plex, you can have all the video files on the main array but have the app data like covers and metadata set to be stored in cache which can speed up the Plex interface compared to having everything on spinning hard drives. So with those set up, it's now time to create a share and install some apps. I just quickly went through and made a basic share and then created a user so I was able to access that share. I then put the server IP into File Explorer and entered in my new user credentials. This gave me access to the array and I tested it by transferring over a random video file to make sure it was working. Now you can move files over manually, but there are ways to automate things like backups from your PC or even smartphone to a server like this to make sure you have your data in multiple places. 
I then decided to mess around with some of the apps just to give you a couple examples of what you could do. I quickly installed Plex which allows you to host and stream your own content. Once installed, I finished setup through the web portal. I was able to see the video file I placed on the server earlier and could stream it. Now Plex from my understanding is best when using the paid for Plex Pass, but there are other options that offer a similar service to Plex like Jellyfin that are free. Then in just a couple of minutes, I installed and set up a basic Minecraft server that I was able to access by using the server IP. Now this M100 definitely isn't ideal for a Minecraft server, but as you can see, it is working. Also, I just set it up to work on my local network, but I would have to set up port forwarding if I wanted people off my network to be able to play with me. So those were just a couple of quick examples, but the sky's the limit in terms of what you're able to do with a home server like this one. You could do home automation through Home Assistant, you could install Pi-hole to block ads network-wide, or even host your own website directly from your server. The possibilities are basically endless and it's pretty fun to learn and experiment with this kind of stuff if you're a nerd like me. In terms of power consumption, it was honestly a bit higher than I expected with an idle power draw of around 25 watts with the drive spun down and 42 with them spun up. With that being said, I haven't really done anything power management or optimization wise as there are probably ways to get those numbers down. All in all, this is a pretty interesting build. I'd love to know what you guys think of a server build like this one and specifically the case and if you'd ever consider using a 3D printed case like this one featured in this video. Printing it went really well on the X1 Carbon and I've been really enjoying using this printer. It just works. I've been printing a lot of these Gridfinity desk organizers and again, I have not had a single failed print. With that being said, the X1C is pretty pricey and most people would be better off with the $600 P1S or even the $330 A1 if you don't care about printing materials like ABS. Also, the AMS system is pretty great. I honestly thought it was kind of a gimmick going into it, and while I haven't done much multicolor printing, I found it super convenient for having multiple filament types, like one slot ABS, one slot PLA, and one support material to easily switch between them. If you're interested in any of these printers, I'll leave links in the description along with links to all the parts mentioned in this video. So yeah guys, I think it's time to wrap this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.